Today I'm going to wrap up uh, a little bit of 20 slides or so that I did get a chance to show last week because of the time element and how much information we had to share. Um, someone said to me, you gave a lot of information there and a little bit was a little bit dark. Some of it was not like, I want to need something to uplift us here with this, in our church community. So I think you'll see something here. And I'm also going to try a little, couple of experiments with you. Um, I showed you this slide. It's just a snippet of the records that we have in the archives of St. James uh, that were extracted by Dr. Leroy Hopkins of the African American Historical Society. All of the black people who were members of our church who went through baptism and marriages and burials here, he extracted that. And it's on a 10 page thing that I passed around last week and some people said, I'd like to have a copy of that. And here's an opportunity. I created a, what's called a QR code and then this, this contracted, condensed version of the big long you know, URL thing from the computer. Um, Anybody has a cell phone, you should be able to snap that and then go to my website and download that 10-page document if you're interested in seeing it. Here's Terry Webb, author, experienced person. Go ahead, do it. I want, to, I want people to see if this works, number one. So uh, this is a good opportunity to, to get your own copy of this you know, one-of-a-kind document that's from our farms. Hey, look, we're doing it. Okay. So let's let's uh, see how this works when we're, we have a little time extra. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. You got the document? Bingo? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Put it back up again. Sure. And it's interesting. Deborah's over there on an angle. You wonder how these pixelated, these digital images are caught, captured on an angle. A kid, a kid pulled it up. Interesting. Okay. Good. This is a good presentation, though. <laughs> I'm getting it the hands away. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Okay. That's experiment number one. Experiment number two. Clarkson, incredible family name, you know, one of the longest standing rectors we have, 1799, died in office basically in 1830. His family has some incredible uh, connections here, but he was there along with Muhlenberg around the same time when the black people left, not only from our church, but the other majority of Christian churches in, this, in the community, and created what is now, uh, stands today, Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. So it was a launch of a new church, predominantly black church. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know how, how, how much hostility there was, if any. We don't know how much amicability there was, if any. How much support, moral, financial. None of that is recorded. It's just unbelievably unfortunate. But we have some interesting spin-off things that happened. We have an example of what the relationship was with at least one majority church, Holy Trinity, when this black church launched itself. We had the pastor at the time, Dr. Endress, who gave the dedication sermon of the new church or the new congregation that was launched. So that indicates that there was some decent relationship between it. And the fact that, this, again, this is a schism about 1820 or so, and, and, the, and the records we have said 50 black people from the community of these various churches, many of whom were uh, either aspiring service providers. Uh, James Clendenin, our guy here, was a house painter. He was a window installer. Windows were very expensive back then. So he was catering probably to some of the well-off people in our congregation, installing glass. That was a big deal at the time. Um, chimney sweeps, uh, barbers, these service industry providers provided African Americans with their first toehold in the economic Western civilization capitalist society that we have. They bought property. They started a church. They hired ministers. So 1820, this is the earliest city directory in the city of Lancaster that we have at Historical Society. And for some reason, there's an 1843, and the next one we have is 1859. We have no idea. No, one's, no one kept those directories in that midterm period. But you can look from 20 years out, the, the black church was known as St. James African Church, Rygert's Lane near South Queen Street. And we also had another guy, Isaac Gilmore, was a member of our church, an African-American man who was a household uh, chimney sweep. He started a congregation somewhere on Charlotte Street, uh, up around Lemon. And we have virtually no record of anything that you can see on any maps about what that was all about. So it's, that's kind of interesting, too. And you see our church at the top, you know, branded as our church is, but, but, but St. James's name is on this new black church. So who was this guy Clarkson who was there? What was, he, what was his attitude about all this stuff? Well, I passed around a piece. I have, they were over there with the table where Bob and the big are. Okay, let me pass that around if you, if you want to take a look at that. It says here, this is from our history book. He was the third son of Dr. Gerardus Clarkson. And what do we know about that particular name and that particular family? It's one of these, I'm pretty sure. Anybody ever hear this family name? Uh, 
mainly because the, the gravestones out there are totally obliterated. But when you look at the records, right outside the, the, uh, the door coming out from the choir room, you come out that back door, and right there is his four tablets on the ground. That's the Clarkson family plot. That's the priest, his wife, Susan, I'm sorry, Grace, uh, and his, his son, Gerardus, named after his father, right? And his wife. So the four of them are lying there. So lo and behold, uh, I'm, you never see the show, Finding yeah. Roots, Henry Rose Gates? Um, he interviewed Anderson Cooper, Ken Burns, and Anna Devere Smith, uh, all of whom, two of whom, forget about Anderson Cooper for a minute, these local, the other two had really cool local connections. So here's experiment number, number two. I'm going to try to show a video. I really, no, we, thanks for John and Lance, Nancy helped me work this out. It worked out pretty cool. So forget Anderson Cooper. Think, listen to what Ken Burns and, and Shane Cooper at the same time. It's a minute long. The history of this country. The Sycamore ancestors of our three guests are a cross section of the American experience during the most pivotal time in our nation's history. With Ken Burns, we shared some unexpected things about two of his ancestors. One held as a prisoner of war, and the other who held slaves. But when we moved up his family tree, we found that Ken has an ancestor who played a unique role in a much earlier West Pennsylvania. He's Ken's paternal fifth great grandfather, Gerardus Clarkson. Now, this is an excerpt from the minutes of the Council of Safety in New York from September 16, 1776. The Council of Safety was a patriot organization during the Revolutionary War. Resolved that a house be taken for a hospital. Resolved that Dr. Gerardus Clarkson be appointed to attend the sick in the said hospital. Your fifth great grandfather, Dr. Gerardus Clarkson, was a surgeon for the Board of War in 1776 and 1777. I think it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so, that guy's third son was our priest. <clears throat> so, there is an interesting lineage here to this incredibly notable filmmaker who has brought history to life for so many millions of people through PBS. And um, some of us have thought, maybe we should reach out to Ken Burns and see if we can bring him to town as part of our 275th. Maybe he'll write us a congratulatory letter for us in case or something. But, you know, who knows? Who knows? Okay, so take that with a little background. And this is a map of 1848 uh, by a guy named Rygert. It shows all the water lines in the city. Um, closer up, you can see uh, St. James up there on the upper right at Duke and Orange, you see, the, uh, you see um, the courthouse in the middle. Come down here to this little plot. There's only a little building down here at the bottom on the angled street right there. That's Rygert's Lane. That's South Queen Street. See that little thing there? Okay. And then notice this little enclave here on the river's edge at Angleside. Does everybody know kind of go geographically where we are? Okay, cool. You guys are Vasco de Gama, right in front of us. <laughs> okay, so what they called that in 1848, colored meeting. That's the colored black church, right? And look, that just blew me away. They said it's plot number 911 in the Hamilton plan of lots. The, it's the original town plan, city of Lancaster. Okay, so why would, when the church wants to launch itself, I don't know, I don't think anybody knows, as far as I know, who, who decided that that was where they wanted to locate the church? Who owned that land? Uh, how much did they pay for it? Did our church help pay for it? Did the Trinity, did the Presbyterian folk help pay for that church and that lot and any building with that uh, connection there? But here's the deal. Uh, look how close it is to Rygert's Lane. Rygert is one of our kin here, too. There's a Rygert connection to uh, members, early members of St. James. That was our riverfront port. That was the connection with the Pennsylvania Canal from the, from the Susquehanna River. Nine or 15, whatever it is, lock and dams all the way up the, up the Conestoga River to that landing point. That would have been where a lot of black people would have got a lot of jobs, and their church is close real by. And also, we know the canal system in Columbia and Wrightsville that came out of Maryland and north and then went north to, from, from Columbia across the state. That was used to, to, to be both for employment for African Americans and also to secret people on those boats back and forth. So I think eventually we might discover that that location there, which is still there, it's a flat a floodplain there on, the, on that bend of the river, the boats apparently didn't go any farther north of that. But I'm betting that the location of the church and that location had something to do with, with the underground railroad, as well as employing a lot of black people doing a lot of heavy labor 
manning those docks and canals. Okay, so that's that's my theory at this point. But we do know Bethel AME and the, the, the similar AME church in uh, Oreville, they were proclaiming themselves in this anniversary thing that they were part of the great, great assistance to slaves uh, escaping to the north as, as, a, as a kind of testimony to their own heritage and lineage. Okay, here's some of the uplifting stuff that we didn't get to last week. Um, lay members, these guys were involved in this early days. About that same time period when this schism was happening in our church, these lay members, we don't know what the priests were doing, what they were saying from the pulpit about slavery and issues like that. We, we just don't have any record of that. Uh, but these guys were speaking out and do, signing uh, resolutions and writing letters to Congress telling them that we are, I don't know if they proclaimed themselves to be members of the church or just individual citizens, but they were out there in front, in print, telling Congress what they believed. And in our records, this is a fabulous story we tell on our tours that we do about old Dinah McIntyre. And Reverend Clarkson buried her in our uh, cemetery. She was 113, we understand. She was born like the first decade of the 18th century. And she was famous for being a fortune teller. Some of you might know that story. So much so that when she died, this is a front page story in the Lancaster Journal, which was the paper in the city at the time. They proclaimed the passing of this woman. And a man named Jacob Getz, who took care of her uh, in, uh, in the, uh, what's, how do they describe it in the, in the uh, end of her life? He was a goodly Samaritan. I don't know who Getz was, but uh, in the evening of her years. It's an interesting thing that this woman, who was uh, made her living for telling fortunes, who's a member here, she was enslaved by a Revolutionary War major, Matthias Slough, very popular. We had these guys, lately, they say that same critical time period, 1820, when they were tearing, we'll get into it in a minute, tearing down the old church, building the new church. Um, we have these guys men, men, men joining up with the Abolition Society. Um, another interesting record, we have di another diner buried in our churchyard, wife of, the, of John Webster, the faithful sexton for St. James for many years. Again, in the journal, this is all from the Journal of Reverend Clarkson. So again, jump ahead a little bit. We have 1848. Unfortunately, we still are segregating the seating in our church in 1848. We had that. I showed you the seating plan from the 1700s. We're still set, setting aside where black people could sit in the church, unfortunately. Again, that was, again, a part of the impetus for them leaving because they couldn't worship where they wanted to and how they wanted to in our church. Um, and Ross Fairweather, is Ross here? She sent me a note and said, she understood, she heard, she read, and this, and I never realized this, but this has to be true as well. I <clears throat> credit her for bringing this to my attention. Black people couldn't become clergy. If you, if you were in the, if you were a member of, if you were a black person in the congregation and you wanted to aspire to, to be a minister, there was no path forward, I'm sure. I don't know what minister in a white majority church would have encouraged that. That could have been another reason why the black folks got up and left and not only the segregated seating, and that's, a, that's another dynamic we should look into somehow. Okay, Bowman was an interesting guy. Um, he was connected to the Revolutionary War through his parentage, his lineage. Um, interesting guy, and of course, you know, he started the Free Church, did away with the few rents, so more common people, the, the, the early German immigrants, many of them who were indentured servants who could not afford to pledge for a certain amount of money for a year. This was Free Church, pay as you go. He sets up and launches this entire new church, which is still right there on the west end of town in West Chestnut, St. John's. We all know well. And so look at this census record about uh, Reverend Bowman. He's a minister. His personal assets are $12,000. Um, his wife marries $5,000. And um, compare that with the developer, Michael Malone, the contractor, who I know, I know from other research, built a lot of homes in the city about this time period. His net worth is $60,000. So compare that family. Uh, and then, see, he's living with a, a, a daughter, it looks like, and then a, a woman who, who might be a domestic servant, an 18-year-old somebody or another, maybe an indentured servant, but a black woman, Louisa Wells, is his domestic servant. And she's buried in the family plot, out in her backyard, our backyard, the little, the little tombstone to the right, that's Mrs. Wells, which I think is a touching little tribute to their family commonality of bringing this woman into their community. We don't know much more about her other than that. We also know that one of Colonel Emlyn Franklin, one of our luminaries buried here, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> led a group of militia, some college students I read somewhere, I think, the late by F and M and Millersville students, out to the bridge on the edge of edge of uh, Lancaster County in that fateful day in the June, and were part of that effort to stop the Confederates from coming across and change national history. If the Confederates had come across that bridge, we would have been in a whole different world here today. 
Uh, so, and as you know the story, they were turned back because they burned the bridge, and that's why they engaged at Gettysburg. And that's why Gettysburg happened when and where it happened. We have Reverend Mombert, uh, who was converted from Judaism to Christianity, uh, German, I believe he was, and uh, he wrote a history of Lancaster County in the 1840s, which is pretty well regarded, it's pretty detailed. Uh, and he gave the eulogy, and we think that's him standing there on the chair at the burial of Thaddeus Stevens, whom he apparently loved a great deal because he poured out his heart at, at his burial, you know, among thousands of people who came to see this great commoner, the great constitutional um, civil rights leader, Barry. And he, he talks about this, look at this wording, it's just amazing. Um, he hated narrow, narrow barriers, exclusive legislation, a fettered press, oligarchies aspiring to overthrow the liberties. It's, it's just remarkable. So he was there, you know, giving the, the big send off to Thad at that time. And we have McCaskey, who was a, a young boy, born in 1830 something, I believe, grew up at the, knee, at the, at the footsteps of Thaddeus Stevens, and he, this is what he says <laughs> about him. Okay, so there's some personality quotes and looks. Uh, we have also, we also know that in the 1860, late 60s period, we launched another church, a, a mission church. It was it was St. James Chapel at the corner of, um, what is it? South Lime and Locust Streets, and, and there it is in relatively same shape today. It became Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can see in the Baystone, and now it's a Latino church. And I don't, all it is in our history book is, you know, Vestry saying, okay, we're gonna do a new church under, I can't remember the, I remember the exact uh, minister at the time. But why, what was the mission, what was the goal, what was the support, we, I don't know that we know that. Um, we had Cyrus Knight, coming up with uh, attending to people with hearing in, uh, uh, impairments, doing a special speech so that they could be more part of the worship service. We had like, uh, our church in the 50s, in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, looking out for the welfare of citizens dealing with um, racial discrimination and substandard housing, inviting people to, for speakers at our church to give testimony to the needs of the community, the disadvantage of the community. We helped stage pageants that uh, highlighted the, the uh, talents of black people in the community. <laughs> um, more, more evidence of that in, the, in that time period, all from our church history, just extracting things. Um, Frank McConnell doing, combining the uh, AME Church and our choir together. And Batchelder uh, speaking out um, at the 100th anniversary of Bethel. I asked Molly if she knows if her dad, or we have records of that exact speech, she, the speech or sermon, to find out what words he was conveying that may have shed light on this notion of why the black people left 18, circa 1820 because I'm sure he would have recounted that history to give a perspective from a well-thought-out sermon, but we can't find it. So, as I said to you last time, Reverend uh, Edward Bailey at Bethel AME today, at a meeting I went to a couple of weeks ago, said, we are where we are today because of the church, the good and the bad, uh, the good stuff, I mean, we, this, there's so much with a full range of, of positives and negatives, and connect the dots kinds of, of issues we're talking about, uh, and so that is where we leave you with the recap of the last history piece, and we have 15 minutes to go, and I'll go through the, what I guess some of you came here for, which is all these things that we don't know about, you know, it's like you turn over a page, you turn over a book, and you, you just look at the, you find more, more things to learn about. Uh, we don't know what it looked like, our original church. We don't know exactly where it was on the campus property, and we still don't. I mean, we, we may, but we don't at this point. Okay, to give you the orientation, aerial view, we know the main, when they tore down the old church, and built the brick core, the core of the brick church that we know of today. Um, and that's the, the footprint of it there in the center. 1870s was the rounded apse toward the east end of the, the church, and then the west side, 1880s, 20 feet bumped that hole out toward the front off of the original 1820 church and built the Romanesque tower in the front that we see there today. Okay, is that, every, is that everybody kind of understand how that <clears throat> church evolved? So here's a representation of the four worship sites of St. James from day one until today present. First one represents the county courthouse, which was on the square at the time. So for that time period, as far as we know, after folks got started meeting in somebody's house, then they moved to the courthouse for their regular meetings, or church services or gatherings, uh, for that time period, until they could raise money, build membership, and find the money to, to build a church. Because I think the land was here available under the Hamilton plan of lots. James Hamilton, is it James? Yeah. Uh, set aside land for the public market, uh, city offices, county offices, and churches and schools, and allowed that, I don't know if it was free or, or very, very affordable for the institutions 
to build community, to, so we can have those society, uh, you know, uh, builders, I guess, community builders in, in place. Okay, so coming ahead, there's the courthouse, and you see the, 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 take note, if you would, please, the configuration of the architecture of that steeple. And you'll see it in a couple of pictures ahead. That's, this is the original courthouse, with, this is the second courthouse, but the, I'm told by people in Lancaster history, the first courthouse, they just basically duplicated the second courthouse after the fire. It almost looked exactly the same. <clears throat> now, this is so interesting. The church, the thing that we have in the, in the volunteer room, the copier room over here, is an 8x10 photograph of this architectural drawing, which is, I'm told, was, this is from our, our history, was found in the, in, by this guy in, Lo in London at the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Uh, and now we have also this interesting take from May of 1841, where the Lancaster County Historical Society is receiving gifts from the community. That's how the collection is, is formulated at this historical society and many others. People just gave them records and papers and books and artifacts, and that's what they have. So at this thing, this is reported in the New Era, that um, the library uh, frame picture containing photographic architect's drawing of the original St. James, made in London, a copy of the original church uh, plan, uh, the building was it was in it was bombed by the blitz, by the blitz apparently the building that it was in and somehow a photograph was taken of it and it came to Saint to the historical society and eventually to Saint James by uh, William Frederick Warner who was shown here from Beverly Hills California but at that time he was a librarian of the Lancaster County Historical Society okay so what we don't know is what portion of any of this structure was built if any we, we it, it's, it's interesting, but it's a, a dilemma, it's a complex, we don't know. But it's really interesting because when this plan was sent, I'm, I'm assuming it was drawn up by someone locally, a contractor, someone skilled in drafting, sent it as, with correspondence to London to the Archbishop looking for some cash to help build this thing because they were very proud, showing they're on the forefront, they're on the frontier, we're building this beautiful church in honor of the <coughs> Episcopal faith handout, right? But they also see, literally, they put a scale on that drawing, which is shown here at the bottom. It's zero to 40 feet. And uh, so what you have here is, this is that letter, an excerpt from that letter, from the vestry at the time, sending to uh, Reverend Daniel Burton, Secretary of the Society, it's the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, which is the outreach ministry of the Episcopal Church. Um, they're saying they've already erected a stone church in, this is 762, uh, and now we, we have lately built a steeple and... Uh, We've taken the liberty to enclosure. They sent that plan, apparently, in 1762. Um, now, again, we don't know if they built what they presented there in drawing or some portion of it. So, And so now go ahead here to 1883, when the first, second big county history is, is issued, Ellis and Evans, History of Lancaster County. This is what they say about our church. Rough stone limestone stood north and south, which is unusual, but it's in church architecture, but in city architecture, think about it. Isn't First Presbyterian, north and south? Dutch Reforms, north and south? Um, well, now Trinity is north and south, so it used to be east and west. But this, this account is saying it's this uh, dimension, it's 44 by 34, facing north and south. So here's that 40-foot scale, and they labeled it St. James in the borough, because the city was a borough at that time, and they give the dates when it started, when it was built. And here's the scale, uh, close, close up. Now, if you overlay that scale on that section of the church, that is 34 feet, approximately, that width right there, if my extrapolation is correct. And if you look at the side of our church, where that north and south 34 by 44 thing is supposed to have been, you can look at that, and I overlay that over top of that, and that's about half the size of the, of the church in that elongated section along Orange Street. So that's one dimension that fits, but we still don't know. So if you, if you do that, if you said that's what it, that's where it was, 34 by 44, north and south, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what it would look like at that location. Because that Ellison Evan account, Evan account said it was at the eastern end of the property, or eastern end of the building. Now, is that too, too much information, too, too clear enough for me to get that so far? <laughs> Thanks. So Bangor, the first church in the area, almost fits that same, same dimension. So my thought is, these guys were listening to or bringing building traditions from Europe, from England. And this building in stone, with the kind of lumber you had to frame up a roof and build a, a, a foundation and a structure, story and a half, two stories above grade, maybe that was a, 
a common dimension that was supportable. Maybe uh, it was a you know easily replicated uh, kind of a, a, a structure because Bangor is right there a testimony also facing north and south. <clears throat> now our church history says same dimensions, but it was along Duke Street and up against uh, Orange Street. Same dimensions, and it was facing east with the, with the altar in the, uh, facing that direction. So, with that description, there's where you would put the um, uh, the first church on the corner there, Duke and Orange. <clears throat> um, so, but they both can't be correct, can they? they one of them's got to be wrong. Cordelia thinks that Ellison Evans is wrong because I think probably because her feeling orientation, most church, most Episcopal churches, Christian churches, are east and west with the setting sun to the behind you and the, the rising sun and the resurrection at the altar up ahead of you as you're worshiping. <clears throat> but they both can't be, uh, can't be right. But this seating plan that we have from 1790s does indeed show that those kind of proportions of uh, 34, 44. <laughs> so Paul Hoffer and I and Leo Shelley years ago went in the basement to try to figure this out. And more recently, Chip and I went down there and tried to take measurements. And it's an absolute maze. It's a warren of stone foundations that and then we have this account another page in our in our history book it says that they built it on the north side of the of the uh, with the north wall which doesn't equate with the other two uh, descriptions so here's carol on palm sunday and then you can see that's the first core of the church there you see the four bays the four window arrangements where those those pipes end over here right to the right of the sign that's where the original 1820 church ended so get that dimension squared away in your there, so that's 34 feet along that way, and then that's 20 feet out there on the west side, that right there. So 34 and times two is 68, and that's the dimension of that of that size along Orange Street. Okay, so you go down to the basement and you overlay that, and this is where that's the foundation. The sketch lines there you see in black are pretty much this is the uh, Murata mains uh, where the security systems uh, arrangement down in the basement. So we just clone that and overlay these things. But those dimensions in black lines is, are the ruins of the foundation. That's what I was telling you, like a warren of building and foundation walls down there. And if you look along, like I'm standing, my, my back is in, on Orange Street looking north. And this is the dimension of those walls down there. And there's that almost 44 feet along that north wall. So that kind of makes sense if you can put that in your grip. Meanwhile, you're standing here, and I'm standing there here on pipes like this, and it's pretty, uh, pretty low down there. Um, and if you, so if you took that same dimension and turned it on the other side, uh, that's where it lines up. And you see that 44 arrangement there. It's, it's close, you know, but I don't know, no cigar. Um, this is a, the 1960s plan from the, when they did the narthex or the uh, cloister work. Uh, there's, and these are the foundations. I added some dimensions and, and identifiers to that. But you see how much crawl space there is there and the, and, and the pathways through there. This this struct this area up here that crawl space I have no idea what that is but those are the dimensions that we can come up with it would take someone who is, has much more building skill than, than I do and, and others do to go in there somebody who's like a real architectural historian beyond way beyond my scope to look at that and kind of come up with a, a conclusion so to conclude uh, this is kind of really cool we have just a couple of minutes left here. This, when they wrote that letter, and they said that they, we have erected a steeple. Now look at that steeple configuration, and look at this 1800 view from the southwest looking northeast. So we're down on Cabbage Hill looking uh, to the northeast, if, that, if you will, if I can orient. This is a sketch that from the historical society. It's about this 18 inches long, something like that. It's an original. There's only one of a kind. And then there's one that was done in the same view from 1853. And so the first one... You see what appears to be, and the legend below says, number six is a St. James Church. And look at that steeple. That looks at exactly like that drawing that was sent to London. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's to the right of, from that perspective, number five, which is the courthouse. So that's where the courthouse was on Center Square. Penn Square, right in the middle where the Civil War Memorial is now. That's where the original courthouse was. I didn't tell you that before. Sorry. So look closely. And then so Dutch Presbyterian Church is... Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on that. Which church is that? Not Dutch Reform. Is that, church, is that the church? Is that the Reform Church on Orange Street? I think yeah? First, I think it's first Reform. First Reform. Okay, so you get that orientation. And then the courthouse is number five and St. James number six. So there's that steeple, and I, it looks really close. So that, that drawing is not going to 
be fantasy. It's going to be very close to what, it, what that artist was looking at from that perspective. So jump forward to 1853, this other view, this is right outside of James Buchanan's office out of Wheatland. It's 36 inches wide, it's beautiful, it's big, super detailed. Now you see Dutch reform for, uh, looking like it does with the Twin Towers on Orange Street. See to the left? Then you see what is, where, what is torn down, uh, St. Paul's across the street, where the, where the condos are. Uh, then you see to the right of that is the church you see uh, the 1844 painting. Now, there's two courthouses here. You see the courthouse to the right of that? That's, and now this is the courthouse with a statue on top. This new one under construction, but this, the old one's still standing there. They hadn't torn it down yet. And that's Presbyterian over there. St. Mary's here. Okay, so the church depicted there, the third church from the left, is this one. With that type of configuration, it was, that was torn off in the 1880s to build what we see today. Okay? Let me just take you back and look at that in a sec. So does that make sense? You see that same church view? The, this and this one, the third one from the left? It's got that stepped uh, kind of treatment on the front of the building. And what they say is, there they go, number 11 under that 1853 thing, it's all labeled out what church is which and what, it, what it's supposed to look like. Now, final picture here. I don't know, I, Chip and I were looking at could figure out what that massive substructure was and wondering whether that could, could, in the basement, could have been the, the basement of the steeple from either the 1820 ch church or the older church. We just don't know. So that's all I had. Look, I'm finished on time.